Thank you so much. That was an incredible introduction. And I am just so honored uh, by all of the Black and Cancer leadership to uh, be able to give this talk. And uh, I have to say, incredibly impressed uh, by your organization and your motivation and, uh, and what you have been able to accomplish, which is just incredible over just a, a very short time period. Uh, so I'm excited to talk today. I'm going to share my screen. and. Uh, describe to you some of the work that we're doing in, uh, uh, in my lab at MIT. And then I'll talk at the end a little bit about my own personal experience and hopefully we'll have a chance for some questions. Uh, and yes, we uh, do use an electrostatic layer by layer assembly approach to generate a range of different uh, thin film biomaterials. It's a very simple method in which uh, we can take a substrate and dip that substrate that may have some initial, let's say negative charge and absorb something that is oppositely charged, a polycation, for example, that absorption will take place from an aqueous solution and uh, will occur until ultimately the surface charge is reversed. And at that point, you have electrostatic repulsion. So now you have a monolayer that has been uh, generated. Uh, at that point, you can dip the same substrate into a dilute aqueous solution uh, that contains the oppositely charged system. And you can continue to do this alternation absorption process until ultimately you build a thin film uh, that you desire. You can incorporate a range of different material sets into these layers. They can include anything from nanomaterials to uh, biologics such as proteins and nucleic acids, all of which carry a native charge. We can even incorporate small molecule drugs that are heavily charged or that can be incorporated into uh, vehicles that are charged. Now, we have used the layer by layer approach to generate a range of different thin films on large scale surfaces for regenerative medicine and a range of other applications. But in our work for the Koch Institute, we're really interested in trying to design a nanoparticle that could be used to target highly aggressive forms of cancer, including the kinds of cancers that uh, undergo genetic mutations that protect them from chemotherapy drugs by allowing them to bypass uh, the uh, pathways for cell death in exposure to those drugs. So we decided to use layer by layer to approach this by taking a core, which can be a liposomal core or a polymeric nanoparticle, designed to carry a negative charge and then absorbing a polycation onto that negatively charged system, uh, then absorbing a nucleic acid, which is strongly negatively charged. And that negatively charged uh, system will then give us an opportunity to have a highly compacted uh, amount of material. So we end up getting something like two to 3,000 copies of let's say siRNA. The nucleic acid is chosen uh, to essentially silence a pathway that enables these tumor cells to survive in the presence of chemo drug. We have to protect that sRNA, so we put down another positively charged layer. And ultimately, because a positively charged nanoparticle will be rapidly cleared from the body because of its tendency to absorb large amounts of protein and be recognized by monocytes and other immune cells, we need something on the outer layer. So here we add that final outer layer that is strongly negatively charged. So we end up with some net repulsion uh, from other mammalian cells that tend to have negatively charged glycans on their surface. Uh, and we also have a high degree of hydration in this outer layer. And that um, associated water actually is something that uh, prevents or lowers the uh, thermodynamic driving force for absorbing other proteins. And we finally want this outer layer uh, if it can, to give us some ability to direct the nanoparticle to where it needs to go, which is the tumor cell. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this is how uh, these nanoparticles look. They essentially have uh, these liposomes, which carry coats of bilayer on them, and it actually does not change the thickness or the size of the nanoparticle very much. We go uh, maybe an increase of 10 to 20 nanometers more 
in the addition of these layers. So they're very thin. Here you can see uh, a micrograph of a polymeric nanoparticle um, as well. So there are some interesting things about using layer by layer for this approach. And that includes the fact that you can layer a poly acid and a poly base together and end up with a, a layer by layer thin film surrounding our nanoparticle that has an effective isoelectric point, a point at which it begins to lose charge. Uh, we've used this, for example, to allow nanoparticles that circulate very well in the uh, bloodstream at pH 7.4 to undergo buffering when they get into an hypoxic part of the body, such as the tumor compartment, in which case we can see a shift in the charge to much lower negative charges and sometimes even to positive charge. And that nanoparticle becomes much more interactive with other cells and cells take those uh, nanoparticles up in a non-specific fashion. And thus we have a nanoparticle that is responsive to the tumor microenvironment. So this is one way to get targeting without even using a very specific targeting moiety. However, it's also possible to select polyelectrolytes, which have some affinity for the cells that we're trying to target. One very straightforward way of doing this is to use a polysaccharide like this one, hyaluronic acid, as the outer layer. HA is actually very well hydrated, very strongly negatively charged, but it also is a native ligand for CD44 a receptor that is highly overexpressed in a number of cancer cells. So it turns out that we can actually use HA coated nanoparticles to target a number of the solid epithelial kinds of cancers uh, that we've been targeting, including triple negative breast cancer, it's overexpressed in non-small cell lung cancer, glioblastoma, and ovarian cancer. Uh, and we can then use that as one of our tags to get into uh, the cells. Shown here, we have the nanoparticles labeled in red. Uh, when we look at cross sections of uh, tumors, uh, we can see that our nanoparticles here, they're labeled green, uh, are able to traverse the stromal layers of, of tumor and get into tumor cells, uh, which are labeled here with the CD44 receptor. You see some nice co-localization in these cases. Now, uh, we've looked at ways in which we can use nucleic acids to target uh, non-small cell lung cancer in this example. Uh, we actually used uh, the PK model, which was developed at uh, the Koch Institute by Tyler Jacks. It actually uh, has two really common uh, aggressive genetic mutations. One of them is SIR and is uh, KRAS, an oncogene that is typically undruggable by small molecules. It's a very uh, uh, aggressive oncogene and causes uh, metastatic behavior and proliferation. Uh, so if we can silence that gene, uh, we may be able to essentially enable chemotherapy drugs to be more effective. Uh, P53 is a guardian gene that is often lost early on in uh, tumor development in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And without the presence of P53 or with single point mutations, uh, we lose some of the guardian role of P53, which monitors for DNA damage and enables apoptosis when DNA damage occurs. So we'd like to restore that function, and we can do that with a microRNA, MIR34A. So in our approach, we've taken our liposomal nanoparticle, uh, and we can incorporate cisplatin, which is the DNA damaging uh, drug of choice for non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, and we can then wrap that liposome with our, essentially our nucleic acid sandwich here, of uh, KRAS siRNA and microRNA, all both absorbed together um, and sandwiched between layers of poly L arginine. Then uh, we then put out our final layer, which is hyaluronic acid, and that's going to give us our CD44 targeting. Uh, when we look at the release of siRNA versus the cisplatin, we can see that siRNA, which is in these outer layers, is released more rapidly. Uh, than the cisplatin, which is released over a, a rate of about three times longer. And this gives us a chance to essentially reprogram these cancer cells so that the cisplatin is much more effective. So when we uh, look at uh, where these nanoparticles go, uh, it's our concern to ensure that they circulate for a long time. And we do see long half-lives of about 28 hours in these systems. We also look at where they distribute. And in healthy mice, we only see distribution 
in the liver here, this is at 48 hours. And this is at a point where we expect to see that accumulation and ultimately excretion of the nanoparticles. However, in mice that have uh, the uh, lung cancer present in this orthotopic model, we can see a large accumulation in the lungs. And this is attributed to a high degree of CD44, uh, which is present, you can see in the CD44 staining of the tumored lung versus the healthy lung. When we look at this model and determine efficacy, uh, we can treat with uh, a vehicle control and uh, we can see that that vehicle control shows us the very rapid pace at which uh, this cancer uh, causes loss of life. Uh, however, when we begin to incorporate the cisplatin in the nanoparticle, we see that there's an improvement. And when we add the combination of cisplatin plus RNA, this combination gives us a 30% improvement in survival, which gets us very excited. Now we continue to look at how we can use siRNA in our systems to address ovarian cancer, uh, but we've also been interested in how we might be able to address ovarian cancer by designing nanoparticles that have a high affinity for these ovarian cancer cells. So um, we actually decided to expand our library. We know that hyaluronic acid is interesting, but what other outer layers may be able to give us a high affinity for ovarian cancer cells? And can that then inform us on how we can design these systems? So we looked at a very systematic study in which we examined the association of nanoparticles with different outer layers, some of them sulfated and some of them uh, with carboxylated outer layers. And we compared their association with 10 ovarian cancer cell lines and seven healthy cell lines and determined which of these systems showed association specifically uh, for our ovarian cancer cells. And there were three that were particularly interesting out of the group that we studied. Hyaluronic acid, which we already understand binds the CD44 receptor. But we also found that polyglutamic acid and polyaspartic acid, which are simple homopolypeptides, uh, do have a high amount of association, even higher than hyaluronic acid, but no known binding partner. Uh, when we look at what's going on in these systems, here we're, we're looking at a series of uh, focal microscope images. Uh, when you look at uh, ovarian cancer cells and hyaluronic acid nanoparticles, we can see that the nanoparticles accumulate in endosomes uh, and ultimately our cargo escapes from those endosomes. And this is how we get our therapeutics to the cell interior. Polyglutamic acid is quite different, however. The nanoparticles don't tend to be internalized at any uh, significant rate. Instead, they tend to reside on the outer membrane of the cell. And polyl aspartic acid has this in-between behavior where we see a kind of caviolar-based uptake uh, that leaves some of the nanoparticles on the membrane and some in. It's very slow in terms of uptake. So uh, we're still trying to understand some of the mechanisms uh, behind these different uptake mechanisms and intracellular uptake um, behavioral patterns However, we thought we could be able to take advantage of the surface bound arrangement, just as we have used the hyaluronic acid system to deliver drugs that need to get inside the cell. We can use polyglutamic acid as a way to deliver drugs to other cells uh, by delivering to the extracellular space and allowing those drugs to interact with other cells membrane receptors. This is particular rel particularly relevant if we want to deliver a protein because proteins get degraded when they get into endosomes. And we prevent that degradation if we can deliver to the outsides of cells. So one protein that's particularly interesting is IL-12, which is a cytokine. And in a collaboration with Daryl Irvin's lab at uh, the Koch Institute, we began ex investigating whether we could use these nanoparticles to deliver IL-12 directly to other cells. And the idea here is that uh, ovarian cancer is known to have uh, a fairly weak response to common immunotherapies, such as anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1. And one of the reasons for this is that uh, ovarian cancer doesn't have a large number of leukocyte infiltrates into these tumors. Because there aren't a large number of immune cells that are already present there, um, 
using a, uh, a therapeutic that modulates immune cells is not really very effective. So the idea here is, can we actually stimulate the immune response in these kinds of cold tumor environments? And one way of doing that is to introduce a cytokine uh, that will initiate the innate immune response and then ultimately allow us to attain an adaptive immune response against the tumor. Well, IL-12 is a great choice for that because uh, it actually activates several cells to generate interferon gamma. Interferon gamma then signals a number of antigen presenting cells to interact with our tumor, pick up antigens, present those antigens. And ultimately uh, we activate CD8 positive T cells, NK cells and CD4 positive cells uh, that actually uh, respond in the cytotoxic um, immune response. So we want to be able to get this very potent stimulator into tumors, but the problem is if it gets into the bloodstream, it's extremely potent. It can actually activate in an, an immuno response uh, within the body that uh, can be uh, powerful. And for that reason, it's failed in clinical trials due to these systemic effects, uh, which can even cause death in extreme cases. So the idea is, can we deliver IL-12 without the safety issue? And can we deliver it directly to these tumor cells? And we'd like to use our uh, high affinity ovarian cancer cell formulation to do that. Uh, this time, we're going to use the liposome again, but we're going to bind our IL-12 to the outside of the lipid layer. We actually looked at several approaches and found that this one was the most effective and gave us the highest loading. Um, we can then still drape uh, after we attach our, our um, we use the nickel his tag to attach our IL-12, we can then drape our polymer around the outside of the liposome, which still bears a negative charge. So now we're adding polyallarginine, which is our positively charged polymer. And uh, we're going to add our negatively charged outer layer. And polyglutamic acid is uh, the outer layer of choice for sticking to the outsides of these cell membranes. We do actually get release of the cytokine because what happens after the nanoparticle has circulated uh, to the tumor and essentially bound to tumor cells is we know that it will eventually begin to deconstruct. It is a single bilayer and with just a small amount of buffering, uh, we begin to erase charge along the, the uh, carboxylic acid backbone. And that causes this uh, nanoparticle to fall apart. So we actually see that the polyallarginine uh, using FRET uh, comes off more rapidly and the IL-12 then follows. And we have this sort of uh, cartoon image of what's happening. It could be a swelling of the outer layer or a complete decomposition of it, uh, but we see that we are able to release IL-12 to the medium. So we wanted to ask the question, can this work in ovarian cancer, which is this very difficult environment uh, for it's stimulating the immune response. And uh, of course, we also want to check on safety as well. Can we rescue to toxicity in these systems? So the first thing we did was uh, after formulating these systems, look at uh, dosing at a range of different uh, levels. And uh, we went to, uh, to quite high levels. Here we're looking at a 10 microgram uh, dosing and this is an intraperitoneal dosing directly to the abdominal cavity of healthy animals. And if we just use the free IL-12, the protein itself um, does cause significant toxicity. We see a lot of weight loss and we also see uh, multiple um, uh, uh, animal deaths because of this. However, when we look at our IL-12 nanoparticle, we no longer see loss of life and we see that we are able to maintain a healthy weight. When we look at the survival in a tumor study, uh, here we're looking at uh, a, a high-grade serious ovarian cancer uh, in a uh, syngenaic model. And um, what we find is that uh, with IL-12, we're able to get uh, you know, essentially some increased survival over just the dextrose control, where we see all of the animals are dying very early in this study. Um, however, we see that even earlier than that, we, we have some loss of animals because of the toxicity-related deaths. 
If we look at our IL-12 nanoparticle, however, we no longer see these uh, early uh, tox-related deaths, and we see that we get an extension of survivability and also 30% uh, of our animals uh, that survived essentially throughout the study. So um, we are interested in both intravenous and intraperitoneal administration of this therapeutic. The reason for this is that um, IP is the best and direct route to get to the cancer, especially when we're using a nanoparticle that has a high binding affinity because it gives us a chance to essentially coat those tumor cells with our nanoparticles and really have a high dose impact. However, uh, IP delivery is not common in all places of care. And we have to think about what would be the most available approach uh, everywhere, and that would be IV. So we look at both, and we can see that with IV injection, we do get uh, accumulation in the tumor, uh, which is uh, much more directed than if we have an unlayered nanoparticle, in other words, just a liposome uh, carrier. When we look at intraperitoneal delivery, we see that there is a very large accumulation. So for IV, we're looking at something close to about 5% of the injected dose, but for IP, we're looking at something like uh, 85 to 90% of the injected dose accumulating with the tumor cells. Um, and uh, we can also look at uh, the recovered fluorescence over time and uh, see these very nice numbers. Now, one of the things we wanted to show is that we're getting the same kind of immune response that we would anticipate if we were delivering the free IL-12, which is this very potent stimulation uh, through interferon gamma. Uh, one of the ways in which we did this was looking at the CD8 positive uh, T cells in the tumor. And we see that our nanoparticle is uh, at least as good as the soluble IL-12. And uh, we can see this is uh, the case uh, when we look at the uh, facts comparing essentially the PBS and the control with our nanoparticle and our soluble factor, both of which have these high fractions of CD4 uh, versus CD8. We also wanted to show that there is uh, a very nice uh, localization of uh, immune cell activation in the tumors themselves. So here you're looking at, uh, by color, the unlayered nanoparticles, IL-12, and the PLE IL-12 nanoparticles, which are the blue and the red. And uh, we're looking in all cases at uh, whether or not we can see um, this enhancement in uh, CD8 positive T cells, and we can, in particular with our formulations. Uh, and yet we don't see that same uptick in uh, the ascites or the spleen. So we do believe this is a tumor specific response because the nanoparticles are accumulating in the tumor and not systemically. An interesting side effect of this is that we did see an enhancement in PDL1. Uh, and this is interesting because uh, there have been studies which show that in uh, a, a case where interferon gamma production is increased in these tumors, uh, we can see a response in that uh, PDL1 begins to be upregulated. Now, this is particularly true for our nanoparticle formulation over the other formulations, including the free IL12. And what's interesting about that is that in this case, it means that we have a uh, tumor that would be susceptible to a combination treatment of our IL-12 followed by anti-PDL1, uh, the very uh, immunotherapy that has been found to be fairly ineffective in many ovarian cancers. Of course, uh, I've been describing one model. It's called the HM1 model. It has a moderate T cell and high granulite, granulocyte infiltration, and it responds to DNA damaging agents, but it's resistant to be uh, anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL1. Uh, it's nice to look at other models. Uh, there's the KPCA model from the Weinberg lab at the Koch Institute. Uh, it's a mostly cold tumor. Um, it has a moderate amount of granulocytes, but it does have a large number of Tregs, and for that reason is responsive to checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so, we look at these two, the HM1 model versus the KPCA model, and we can see that uh, 
we get a response that is enhanced for a nanoparticle in both cases. Uh, for the KPCA model, we get an even uh, more robust response in that we get full survival of our animals uh, treated with IL-12 nanoparticles. So we've continued to work on this uh, concept. Uh, we're looking at how we can even more effectively contain the IL-12 to the tumor cell and control its release over more extended time periods, um, how we might be able to look at the ways in which we attach IL-12 to our nanoparticle and whether a bound IL-12 to the nanoparticle is more effective or one that is released. And if so, do we want that release to be regulated uh, by enzymes that are present in the tumor and therefore be more tumor responsive, thus allowing us to perhaps dose more and have more efficiency while maintaining safety. We're also looking at combinations with other cytokines that are known to pair well with IL-12, including IL-2. And uh, we're working with our friends in the Irvin Lab and uh, uh, others at the Koch Institute who have a great knowledge of immunology in tumor systems. Now, um, I'll tell you a very short story about how we've been examining uh, another aspect of our nanoparticle system. Uh, there have been studies which have shown that the softer a nanomaterial is, the longer it may be able to circulate over time. Uh, and part of this is, is, is um, associated with the idea that softer nanoparticles can undergo deformations that allow them to get in between the junctions of cells. And that allows a, uh, a much longer half-life. So we decided to test this in our own system by asking the question, does our outer layer um, provide a chemical surface while maintaining the mechanical underlying property? And if so, um, can we then modulate that core mechanical stiffness uh, to change the nature of the circulation of these nanoparticles and their accumulation in tumors? Uh, so our student, uh, a former student, Steph Kahn, uh, actually designed these more rigid layer-by-layer -layer nanoparticles uh, by using these uh, fully saturated lipids that tend to create these very nice crystalline faceted liposomes, and then intentionally disrupted that crystallinity by introducing cholesterol, which gave us these more compliant uh, liposomes. And uh, in doing so, she was able to show that she changed the rigidity, but she did not change the size or the charge on these nanoparticles. Here you can see what these nanoparticles look like under the cryo electron microscope, uh, where we have the rigid and the soft liposome. And then we have the layered rigid and soft liposome. And we can see that we're maintaining um, these uh, systems. Uh, in our system, we actually are using cholesterol to soften the nanoparticle. And a side is that you may see work in which one starts with unsaturated lipids that are even softer, and then they move to cholesterol to make them more rigid. So just to give a little bit of calibration on other liposomal systems. And uh, we actually looked at uh, a number of different factors with these systems, both uh, cellular uptake and uptake in vivo. And in vivo uptake within tumors indicated that the soft LBL nanoparticles have a higher tumor accumulation. And here we try to show this on the left with the Psi 7 nanoparticle signal in the rigid systems versus the soft systems on the bottom. Uh, and of course, in, on the right-hand side, this is just the tumor itself, which has its own fluorescence. Uh, we can actually look at the average tumor radiant efficiency and, oops, skipped ahead here. And, and see that we have much more of the nanoparticle accumulated in our tumor. And uh, here we're just looking at the average tumor radiance itself, which is normalized for each of these systems. It may be a little bit hard to see here, but uh, we used cross sections in microscopy uh, to essentially examine the penetration within the tumor for the rigid versus the soft nanoparticle, which is labeled in red. And uh, we found a great deal more fluorescence throughout the tumor in the soft LBL system versus the rigid LBL system. Um, we actually then used um, integration across these images 
to compare these systems and found that the soft versus the rigid integrated density uh, gives us a much higher accumulation for the soft system. Um, and we were also able to look at average radiant efficiency uh, overall for the rigid and the soft. And we can see for each of these mice that the bars are higher for the soft nanoparticle versus the rigid. In summary, this is a, a, new, a newer project or study. And uh, what we're learning is that we can use this tunability of the rigidity of the core to perhaps also impact how these nanoparticles traffic. And if this is the case, we can begin to look at uh, how we can create softer or more rigid nanoparticle cores, depending on whether we're using an intravenous or an intraperitoneal delivery approach. Uh, and we are therefore adding one more tool to our toolkit, along with the surface chemistry and uh, the encapsulation capability, we have mechanical properties. I think I'm running short on time, so I'm going to skip these last couple of examples, only to uh, mention that um, we can use these nanoparticles in other areas. Uh, we've been looking at using them to target glioblastoma by combining uh, specifically uh, molecules or peptides on the surface of our nanoparticle that help us traverse the blood-brain barrier, um, and combining that with outer layers that have a high affinity for the uh, glioma cells themselves over healthy cells. Um, we're also doing work uh, in um, other areas, including infectious disease, and we hope to learn ultimately how to tune these nanoparticles to those kinds of approaches as well. But uh, in short, the electrostatic assembly approach gives us uh, a number of different ways in which we can control the trafficking of cells and their localization and uh, to leverage and target different cell types. And also provides a tool to understand and enhance nanomedicine approaches. So I'd like to thank and acknowledge all of the uh, folks who were involved in this work. And I talked a lot about the work of folks done over here on the left-hand side, highlighted in bold. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators. Uh, in particular, I, I mentioned work that we did with Daryl Irvin, highlighted in red here and uh, the folks who funded this work. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Blacks and can Black and Cancer because uh, this work is going to be essentially extended uh, so that we can examine uh, minimal residual disease and other kinds of uh, important uh, tumor states for ovarian cancer and how we might be able to target them uh, using the approaches I described here uh, with the Black and Cancer Award. But I wanted to talk a little bit about my own personal experience. Um, MIT was uh, a transformative experience for me um, because it gave me an opportunity to essentially uh, learn that even though you can be in an incredibly scary place, uh, and for me, uh, becoming a, a, an undergraduate at MIT uh, that first year, was I was in a constant state of fear because I wanted to succeed and the work was hard. Um, but I did learn to have faith in myself, to have confidence in myself and to, um, and to reach out for help uh, when I needed it. Uh, I learned how to collaborate with my friends and uh, how to essentially prepare myself for, uh, for long journeys. And that actually was very meaningful for me. Ultimately, I got my uh, bachelor's degree and went away and worked for a couple of years, realized that I really loved research and I really loved uh, working with polymers and nanomaterials and chemistry. I loved all of those things and went back uh, for a PhD ultimately at MIT. Uh, and in that process, I gained a great deal more confidence about uh, what I could do. Um, one of the things that I think was important about that experience was that I also was able to generate a large number of mentors, mentors of many different kinds. Um, my own thesis advisor and thesis committee included uh, some of my strongest proponents at that time. And for me, it was important to have uh, an advisor and a thesis committee that were fully vested in me and my success. 
Um, but uh, each one brought a different perspective, which was helpful to me. Um, uh, Professor Rubner, Michael Rubner, was my thesis advisor. And I, when I joined his lab, one of the things I modeled from him was how to have a life as well as a research career. He was an assistant professor at that time going up for tenure and yet made sure that there were boundaries in his life. And uh, at that time as a married graduate student who ultimately had my son at the time that I was in grad school, it was important, important for me to have someone who could understand that experience. Uh, Bob Cohen, on the other hand, was an ultimate cheerleader. He was excited about everything that I did and, and shouted it out to the world, a real proponent for me, and is perhaps the reason why I ended up interviewing for my job that I ultimately took here at MIT. But I also had mentors who gave me unique perspectives. Jim Gates was the first Black professor um, I'd ever had, and uh, he was a professor of physics uh, and math at the time that he was at MIT and I was an undergrad and he tutored uh, the black students and uh, uh, we had a black student union that held a tutorial session. And uh, it was from him that I, I learned what I could be. And Arnie Stansell is a chemical engineer who uh, uh, ultimately was, took on huge leadership roles in companies and also at universities and uh, modeled to me uh, a kind of senior level uh, perspective on life. But some of my greatest mentors were actually my peers, uh, people who uh, essentially were shoulder to shoulder with me. Uh, we would reach out to each other, find each other, and talk to each other about our problems, our issues, our struggles. And really, we held each other together. And I think it's important uh, as I speak to you today, for you to recognize each other as those mentors, those peer mentors. And in that sense, I encourage you to reach out to others. Um, no one really prospers when they are isolated. So anytime you do begin to feel isolated, make uh, intentional uh, pushes to reach out and talk to people who will listen to you, who can hear you. Um, mentors, play a very large role in moving your career forward. And we all know that, but perhaps recognizing that there are multiple kinds of mentorships that play different roles in your life. And that that is something that is continually changing is something to keep in mind. Um, peers can also provide that critical advice and input. I also encourage you to feed your own personal science vision. Um, this is something that is uh, it's, it's kind of interesting as you are entering graduate school and then moving on to postgraduate work and ultimately to a principal investigator phase. Um, you're trying to get used to that idea of formulating your idea and putting your, placing your bets behind it. Basically, this is what you're writing your proposal on. This is what you are asking people to fund you on. But um, continue to do that, don't allow discouragement or critique or this sometimes failure that has to come as we do science uh, to defeat you. Uh, instead, let those negative experiences inform you, inform you of uh, what you can learn from the experience, but also teach you about who you are and how you respond to these kinds of experiences. Find ways to, uh, to shelter yourself, to build yourself up and to heal yourself. Uh, step away if you need to, but then come back. Um, and always be aware that your perspective is the only one, you are the only one who can bring it forward. Because um, without your unique perspective, there may be a problem that remains unsolved or a perspective that isn't seen. Don't be afraid to think big and definitely don't be afraid to expand, to dive into new things, even later in career. Um, I began working on drug delivery uh, actually after I got tenure um, and it became really the focus of my lab. So um, I think it's really important to uh, think about where you're going and where you can go continuously throughout your life. And finally, it's the people who make the kinds of things that we do special. 
Um, for me, as a faculty member, those people are the many, many students that have trained in my lab and gone on into industry, gone on into consulting, into medicine, and into other PI and faculty positions. I'm incredibly proud of all of them. This is uh, actually an older slide, so there are a lot of pictures missing from this one, uh, but they are all um, amazing uh, people who are out doing their own thing in the world. Um, and I know that you will ultimately have that impact on the people that you work alongside and uh, that you will be able to provide the kind of leadership that inspires others. So I'm going to stop there and uh, hope that we have time for some questions. Dr. Hammond, thank you so much for taking the time to give our keynote address today. Just hearing about the work that you're doing and the breadth of work and all of the incredible applications that it can have are just astounding. So thank you for the work that you're doing, um, which ultimately with you know, the rate of cancer going up, not just you know, in the UK and the US, but worldwide, we know will have a, a big impact. So you know, huge congratulations on the work that you're doing. I'm really excited for what you'll be able to further do with the, with the award, so. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. No, that's no problem. Um, so we had a couple of questions during uh, your presentation. Um, one of them being, uh, is there any release of the nanoparticle cargo in the liver or the kidneys? Absolutely. So one of the things about nanomedicine is that the nanoparticles do tend to accumulate and excrete through the liver, which is the uh, filtration organ. Uh, so we know that nanoparticles end up there. However, typically we do a lot of work looking at toxicology of the liver, and we don't see signs that drug is being delivered to the liver. So it could be that this accumulation and excretion occurs without release. Um, uh, because of the way that we've packaged our nanoparticles, we try to target tumor cells more specifically. But this is one of the uh, issues of nanomedicine. One of the things that we always work with is the fact that uh, we have to understand what's happening with the liver, because this is, this is the exit way for our nanoparticles. Um, but what we have found with our systems is that we're not seeing any release in the uh, liver, uh, which, is, which is what we want. Brilliant, brilliant. So one of the other questions was, um, were the nanoparticles tested in other histologic subtypes such as clear cell, endometrioid, LGS, and what was the outcome? So seeing as they're specific to the primary tumors, will they be effective in metastasis? Um, and then the ex in the experiment with the siRNA and the cisplatin, was there cisplatin spillover in the circulation? I know that's a lot, so let me know if you need to go back to any particular part <laughs> um, of the question. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, so we have focused on high-grade serous ovarian cancer in our ovarian cancer models, uh, in part because of that huge tendency for resistance, because we feel that the nanoparticle systems that we're designing are designed either to silence some of these resistance pathways or to upregulate the immune system in those cancers. However, very recently, I've been able to have conversations with folks who are working with clear cell and some of the other ovarian cancer types. And there may be some interesting things that we can do um, in those cancer types as well. Um, in some cases, there's an interest in um, inhibitors and other combinations. We've done some of that work in high grade and we think those might be translatable to some of the other ovarian cancer types. Um, we do find that the nanoparticles we've designed are particularly um, taken up by the more metastatic and aggressive tumor cell types and those that overexpress CD44. So we would, I think it would be interesting to examine uh, the packaging of these nanoparticles such that they have affinities for these other ovarian cancer cell types. For the cisplatin release, and you might tell me if I skipped something there. For the cisplatin- yeah, release, we can go back. <laughs> <laughs> for the cisplatin release, um, we typically, in, in, at least in the model that we um, that I described for non-small cell lung cancer, we also did an analysis of uh, systemic to tox toxicology, and we didn't see any signs of upregulation of tox in the bloodstream or in the liver. Uh, so we believe the cisplatin does remain fairly well contained. Um, and uh, because we get this very nice accumulation in the lungs, which is quite high, um, this is concentrated in the lungs. 
Um, we do always do a, um, a dose ex escalation study with animals to determine the maximum tolerated dose in our nanoparticles, which is always going to be higher than the free drug, which is, you know, so we definitely have, uh, you know, safety pro profile that exceeds that of the, of the current drug. Brilliant. So I think the, the in-between question was, uh, since they're specific to the primary tumors, will they be effective in, met in metastasis? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. That's a great <laughs> question, first of all. Um, and the real answer is we don't know yet. Um, it's possible that they could be because um, the CD44, you know, protein that I described, it does show up in some of these metastatic models. Uh, and a lot of the orthotopic tumor models that we've worked on tend to be very aggressive and tend to metastasize to other parts of the body. So we, we see, um, for example, that our nanoparticle accumulates in metastases that show up in the uh, you know, intestine and other parts of the IP cavity. So for metastases, we're seeing that the targeting works. However, when a patient is treated and then we get uh, sort of a recurrence of the cancer somewhere else, uh, often called minimal residual disease, um, we haven't done an analysis on a model like that. We're actually interested in that. And uh, we're trying to work with collaborators to see if we can uh, essentially have an idea of what those cells are like and uh, if we can treat them. Okay, awesome. That's, that's amazing. Um, so what are your thoughts on combining nanoparticles with engineered cells for drug delivery? Ah, interesting. I think that there could be something interesting there. I think um, one of the things that we have, we have primarily looked at sort of cell-free immunotherapies because we think we can access the, um, the, uh, the IP cavity or other regions of the body with our nanoparticle system and get this direct upregulation of the innate immune cells that are present. However, it is not outside, you know, uh, imagination that one might be able to engineer cells that um, essentially uh, are armed to essentially uh, are equipped to get an immuno immunological response going, and then use nanoparticles to assist in that or to uh, expand that immune response. So I, I can definitely imagine ways in which they could work together. Um, and of course, if they're engineered cells, you can engineer in them something that is very uniquely targetable and use the nanoparticle to go straight to them. So there is something interesting there, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when we talk about the, the drugs that are available to be able to put into the nanoparticle. So what are the, what are the limitations when it comes to choosing that drug? So for example, paclitaxel is a particularly bulky um, group. Um, what are your, like, how does it work in terms of that? Oh, could you repeat that? I, I missed the last little bit. So for example, paclitaxel is quite a, a bulky compound. Um, so how does it work in terms of your decisions as to what goes into uh -huh. the nanoparticle in the first place um, and deciding what, which therapies you want to move forward with? Excellent. Uh, so yes, in fact, we have worked with both very hydrophobic and very hydrophilic drugs. And typically it's that water solubility that determines how we package it and if we can work with it at all. So what we found is um, uh, we have worked with different collaborators. Uh, we've had collaborators who have essentially these very hydrophobic inhibitors, and we have had to learn how to encapsulate those inhibitors, typically using PLGA, which is very hydrophobic. Um, and uh, we've also found that uh, amongst those, that set of inhibitors, there are ones that are going to be more soluble in the polymeric matrix than others. Uh, so uh, we'll usually work with a subset of inhibitors, for example, that are going to work there. However, for water-soluble systems, we typically can get them into a liposome very easily because of the aqueous core of the liposome. And we've also worked with amphiphilic molecules that reside within the bilayer of the liposome. So we have a fairly good range of um, systems that can solubilize uh, what, what I would describe as small and medium-sized molecules. Uh, and I think the real challenge is when we get to something that is... Um, it's not so much the bulkiness, but it is very water-hating <laughs> because if they're very water-hating and they're also 
uh, not very soluble in the more common polyesters that are hydrophobic, but um, uh, perhaps not compatible, then that they become more problematic to encapsulate. Right. Uh, so we'll give you one, one final question, um, unrelated to your science, but. Uh, oh, I would, no, no, no worries. I would say that um, I've experienced these two kinds of uh, people in my life throughout and uh, sponsors are people who recognize something incredible about you and then spread the word, you know, uh, and sometimes will you know, find a way to, to boost you up. Um, so I've had, I think the, the best examples are um, early in my career, at that time I was working in polymer self-esteem and uh, I spoke with a program officer who immediately was engaged with the work that we were doing and ultimately um, uh, found a way to sort of move me to a place where I was visible to others who uh, could provide significant funding uh, for some of our early work. Um, I've had others who, uh, I, I mentioned one person on my thesis committee who was probably responsible for me interviewing for uh, my MIT position. Uh, and this is someone I said was, you know, he, he didn't spend a lot of time giving me a lot of advice, but he was a cheerleader. So whenever he was out in the world, and someone mentioned my name, he would just you know, amplify, amplify. Um, and he was the one who dropped a line to the department head in chemical engineering at that time. This is someone you should be interviewing. Why aren't you interviewing this person? You know, um, so I think that is you know, a very unique role because they're the cheerleader. And mentors have been people who will tell you some of the, the rough stuff, you know, you know, if you really want to move ahead, you need to work on this. Uh, but they'll also um, provide you with spaces that allow you to grow, you know? So I, I, I feel like uh, in, my, in my life, people have lived in a continuum and often they are one and then the other or live somewhere in between. That's really great. And it's really important to know what the difference is between those and, and how they can have an impact on your career moving forward. Um, and, and also for people to think about whether they are being a sponsor for somebody or a mentor and what those different roles look like. Um, so we've had a couple more science questions come in. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll ask you one more. And then I know that you're, you have a busy rest of your day, so we'll let you get on. Um, but one of the questions was, how do the nanoparticles affect dendritic B cells and mac macrophage activity since they're antigen presenting cells that kind of contribute to tumor killing? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we're actually doing a study now where we're looking at um, how our nanoparticles are taken up in competition between tumor cells and uh, uh, dendritic cells, macrophages, and other cells that may compete for those nanoparticles. And we think that uh, depending on the design and what's presented on the outer surface of nanoparticles, you can definitely, in fact, intentionally target uh, dendritic cells and macrophages like all of these nanoparticles. Um, so when we're doing something like a uh, delivery of a, of a cytokine, uh, we can actually use this as a way to turn up the activity of these cells. Um, when we are delivering a, a, a chemotherapy drug, we want to try to avoid them. Uh, so this is actually a, a, a topic that we're spending some time on now. Dendritic cells are particularly important to us because we're uh, learning that if dendritic cells present um, specific uh, cytokines along with the antigen, we can actually upregulate immune responses. So we're trying to work on ways in which we can selectively uh, tap on these cells. Awesome. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today for, you know, talking about your work, but also about kind of your experience as a researcher. And I know that you have a busy day ahead, so we don't want to keep you too long. Um, but thank you again so much. Thank you so much. And this, it's been a wonderful opportunity to talk and to answer your questions. And I, I hope uh, I get a chance to meet everybody on the Zoom at some point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I want to take this moment to hand over to James, who is 
uh, part of the Emerald Foundation and will talk about our postdoctoral award. All right, well, um, you know, thank you again, Dr. Hammond, for a great talk. Um, we are proud to have you part of the Emerald family. Um, and we look forward to uh, one day meeting you in person over the next three years of this award. Um, uh, and I do, before I announce the awards, um, I wanna take just a minute to, for everyone to, you know, via Zoom the best way we can recognize the work that Sigourney and Henry put into building Black and Cancer. Um, you know, yes, claps and um, applause all around. You know, a year ago, um, we had the idea to make more Black PIs. Um, and I think we're gonna make major steps in that uh, in the next few minutes here. Um, so I do want to explain, you know, something that Emerald Foundation hit on with this award to Dr. Hammond um, is that, you know, we really wanted to grow Black and Cancer. And we thought Dr. Hammond would be a great brand ambassador. Um, but at the same time, giving out that award meant that we weren't gonna give out as many postdoc awards, right? We, I promised um, a year ago that we would give out one. Um, and over the course of meeting all the applicants and speaking with my board of directors, uh, I presented them with this problem that I had is that we could give Dr. Hammond an award or we could give three postdoc awards. Um, and they solved this problem for me in the best way possible. And they said, let's do it all. So um, we're not gonna give out one postdoc award today. We're gonna give out three. Um, and I'm very, very excited to announce um, that our first uh, Black and Cancer Fellow will be Dr. Jessica Queen from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Um, she has a great project entitled A Microbiota-Induced Switch to Immune Checkpoint Inhibitor Responsiveness in Colon Cancer. Um, and so we congratulate uh, Dr. Queen, who will soon one day be Professor Queen. Um, <clears throat> and, and there she is. Um, uh, so that will be our first winner. Um, and like I said, now, um, these next two winners were not um, part of the original um, agreement that we had made. These are all thanks to the Emerald Foundation Board of Directors, who are not on this call, but um, you know, I want to acknowledge them um, in that when I brought up this partnership, they were so enthusiastic, they were as enthusiastic as Henry and Sigourney and Chris were um, when I first brought this uh, idea up to them. So these next two awards are completely thanks to the Emerald Foundation um, Board of Directors. Um, our next winner will be Dr. Jay Gardner from Fox Chase Cancer Center. Uh, her project is, um, sorry, I can't read my own handwriting here, investigating the role of BRG1 dependent epigenetic regulation on PDAC fibroblast pro tumorigenic functions. Um, we're very excited to have Dr. Gardner joined Dr. Queen um, in the Emerald Foundation Black and Cancer um, Fellows. And finally, um, we have our, our one last award. Um, we'll be going to Dr. Uriah Israel at uh, California Institute of Technology, Caltech. And he's gonna be building a hierarchical representation for spatial relationships in solid tumors with geometric deep learning. So this was not of my background either, so I will translate his title. So what it means is when we do multiplexed imaging of tumor samples and we have so much data that human beings can't comprehend it, he's gonna build deep learning platforms to make you know, predictive decisions about people's tumors from biopsy. So is this, you know, is this resected tumor, breast tumor likely to you know, stay cold or is, are we looking at something that's gonna turn into cancer? Is this tumor likely to invade um, or you know, doesn't show signs of invasion? Um, so uh, congratulations to all three of our winners. Um, I look forward, 
to meeting everyone in person over the next three years. And I do want to say one more time that, um, you know, Emerald Foundation is proud to partner with Black and Cancer, and we look forward to doing this again next year. Thank you so much, James, and a huge, huge congratulations to our inaugural, not singular, but triple um, postdoctoral fellowship award winners. Um, we're so incredibly proud of all of you and to have you as part of the Black and Cancer family. Um, additionally, you know, to all of the finalists, we know that you all did an incredible job and we would love you to reapply if James gives us James gives us some more money next year. Um, so thank you so much. Additionally, as this is the final part of Black and Cancer Week 2021, we wanna say thank you to everybody who has taken part, everybody who has listened to a talk or who has tweeted or who has just been around to be a part of this Black and Cancer whole week. It's been incredible. Um, and we hope that you have made the most of it, that you have networked, that you have found your your community here. And as Sigourney said, reapply next year. There will be, we will be here next year and there will be more, more Black and Cancer Fellows one year from now. Um, I don't know whether Henry would like to say anything. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I definitely was trying to get myself off the mute. This one's a congrats again to all the winners, all the new fellows. Um, I don't think me and Sigourney, either of us, thought that we would be here a year from now, oh, a year ago. Um, it was literally an exchange over Twitter about how do we bring people who look like us together um, to make change and to create more of us in these spaces. And so that one conversation led us to three new postdoc fellows, um, a, a established fellow and more to come. Um, and so I just want to say happy Black and Cancer Week. It's the end of the week. Um, it was amazing. Next year is going to be great. So fingers crossed we can all meet in person, hopefully. Um, but I just want to say thank you again for joining us and supporting us and advocating for the things that we do. Um, I'm not going to keep you longer on your Friday, but we just wanted to say you're from the Black and Cancer family as a whole, um, we really appreciate everything, all the support, and we hope to see you again next year. And before I forget, just a huge, huge shout out and thank you to both our Black and Cancer board and the organizing committee of 2021. You have been incredible. You have put together all of this um, and we couldn't be more glad to have you on, on the team. So a huge thank you for all of the hard work you guys have been putting in over the last few months to make this what it was. Exactly, we'll fall apart if it wasn't for you. So really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, so thank you so much.